All right, folks, it's that time again for another dramatic blog reading. Today's issue, episode, article is called The Redemption of Christia Freeland? And once again, it's not on screen. You can follow along if you click the link in the description. Uh, this is full screen. I can't see my face while I'm reading this, so uh, trust me, I'm not like hamming up for the camera. My face just looks like this. Okay, here we go. The Redemption of Christia Freeland? Days after being labeled a criminal, she appears in Parliament. So this is going to be kind of like a reaction video, except there's no video. Um, I'm just telling you what I saw. So you can go watch the question period if you want to, but you probably don't want to, which is, you'd probably rather watch this, as I explain here. I know it's hard to watch our country falling apart before our very eyes. So here's the play-by-play -play today, as our finance minister and my MP appears before the House mere moments, or rather days, after the court's announcement that Christia Freeland violated Pierre Trudeau's Charter of Rights the day she froze our banking system. Valentine's Day, 2022. Never forget. Here's what she had to say for herself today amid other MPs in question period, our first session back since the landmark ruling. Today, in question period, Today the Parliament resumed. My representative, evil Ms. Freeland, who has got to go, is the star of today's episode. Will she, won't she be the first female PM elected, or will she go the way of Warhawk Clinton? Hillary Clinton, that is. They always told me feminism and atheism would save the world from war, but is her feminism peaceful? Do her citizens get to give informed consent on an ongoing basis to her war? Of course not. She banned RT. Let's see what she will say when she opens her mouth in session today. The first day back to school since Principal Mosley said he knows what you did last Valentine's Day. I mean, two Valentine's Days ago. You fucked with the banking system, Christia. You had one job. And Justice Mosley isn't happy with what you kids have been up to. Or so, she, so he told us over the break. I'm watching on CPAC as I write this, where the YouTube comments are disabled. Abolish censorship, abolish Freelance Canada. But uh, third parties do post commentable versions. Uh, bless their pirating hearts. So you can see a link right there. Here we go, folks. Episode one: The Redemption of Christia Freeland? Question mark. We open with inflation, and whose fault is that? The wayward money printing is often pointed at, and also the claim that inflation is a global issue is often made. But apparently, the global issue in this segment is not war. But just keeping up with the Joneses, we're reassured not that the spending is worth the cost or that the military spending that produces this cost of living crisis as a consequence of a wartime economy will pave a path to peace, only that our inflation is comparable to the economic enemy, other first world countries. 13 minutes in, the Conservatives finally bring it up, the Emergencies Act, and the quote-unquote crisis of his own making engineered by Trudeau for his father's theatrics to find a sequel using the Successor Act, which Brand today remarked has never been used in Canadian history, but he got it wrong psychoanalytically, for the Emergencies Act serves the same function psychoanalytically for Justin that, in his mind, the War Measures Act played for Daddy, and not to be upstaged by his father, which no one wants for themselves. This debacle, which may lead to his resignation and Christia's, was theatrically necessary as part of Trudeau's acting out his childhood trauma, not legally necessary as Justice Mosley ruled. And Christia is no better, for Nazi or not, she thinks the ends will justify the means, because her perspective, somehow, is superior to ours, the collective of deplorables, who independently err towards the truth in a manner some group think collective like the liberals never will in their ideological purity. 18 minutes in, the Conservatives attack the plan to quadruple the carbon tax amid a cost of living crisis. But they don't propose an income or a wealth tax in its place. I am reminded of what the majority report quoted from one progressive author, quote, don't tax a molecule, tax the rich, unquote. But the Conservatives won't tell you that. 20 minutes in, we're attacking the Liberal NDP coalition. From a Conservative standpoint, this is an obvious move. But it was also Jugmeet's best response to Mosley's ruling, to blame the coalition as a package deal 
for the NDP's compliance with the Emergencies Act. Once again, more independence, not more accuracy, would be the solution to our disinformation age. 25 minutes in, we finally hear from Polyev. He opens on the subject of recent hate crimes against Muslims, um, which are horrible, uh, saving human rights for later in the discussion, a moment of silence for victims ensues. And then Pierre begins in earnest, welcoming Justin back from his expensive vacation, LOL. I haven't, I haven't had one in a while either, Pierre, but I'm sure you have. Uh, Pierre asks him to, quote, overturn inflationary policies. But what does he mean? War or the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit? The latter was a drop in a bucket in comparison in terms of inflationary spending. Trudeau responds off topic back to the moment of silence and today's ceremonial thing of the day on drama teacher autopilot and Pierre brings us back to the topic food banks and the cost of housing. Pierre asks Trudeau to remove red tape for developers a change in which developer buddies would benefit. Trudeau calls it a personal attack with a skin so thin it's fragile unless he moisturizes but they covered that in theater uh, he just says, we're working on it, more or less. And uh, many of these quotations will be paraphrases, just so we're clear. I have to translate political English into English. Pierre lays in again, your personal vacation, Justin, he tells us, cost us 80 grand and it increased emissions. Trudeau's response is just that Pierre has no plan. Well, I do. Tax the rich emitters. But you won't catch even Jugmeet saying that. Pierre retorts again with the question, how do you justify your trip in the era of Zoom? He didn't put it that way. I put it that way. He should, have, he should get me to write this. Um, and then Pierre asks if heating prices can be brought down by easing the carbon tax. Trudeau complains about other bills the opposition opposed, which is their job. In a tit-for-tat digression from any topic, he can barely contain a schoolroom long enough to keep them on the reading. A desperate pivot comes after desperate pivot, never landing squarely on the issue and looking Canadians squarely between the eyes. Trudeau complains that they have lots of projects that sound good, he almost sounds hurt that he isn't getting credit for these developer buddy programs, and instead people are looking at the actual numbers on the ground. 35 minutes in, the block steps in to diffuse the tension, which is going nowhere fast. He asks about immigration. Trudeau responds basically, immigration's great, and moves on. But great for what? Great for who? It's great for getting re-elected as a liberal, which are the quote-unquote beautiful decades to come he refers to dreaming of here, endless years of nepotism in Canada and the end to true democracy. 38 minutes in, we finally hear from Singh. He means it, what he says, neither major party quote-unquote gets it and takes a housing crisis seriously. But does he? His supply and confidence deal is why we have no diversity of thought in Parliament. Trudeau fires back in controlled opposition, saying retorts that PM replies, dude, we're on it, good show. He mentions a tax-free savings account, like the 10% of Torontonians going to the food bank have anything left to save. How out of touch. Sheer has to jump in here. He makes the point I just typed here moments after I typed it. A tax-free savings account is irrelevant when you go to the food bank. <laughs> and 41 minutes in, the moment everyone's waiting for, the witch who isn't dead, the evil ice queen of the north, the honorable question mark, Deputy Freeland speaks. She says everyone, quote unquote, understands the crisis, which is why they are working, quote unquote, aggressively to build housing. As if it's the emotion that counts, just as in her flimsy defense of violating human rights. It felt right. And Trudeau said the same thing. Well, it felt good for her, if you take my analysis from earlier as it happened. This is what I wrote on Valentine's Day 2022. Very briefly, I said, Justin and Christia fulfill each other's fantasies on Valentine's Day. Justin likes to play daddy and invoke his daddy's act, just like daddy. And Christia always wanted to be in everyone's financial business. This is the real reason Justin took a divisive approach. So he would get to invoke daddy's act, not so he would have to. Um, I spoke briefly then on the 14th. You can see another article um, a few days after that. But uh, 
We're talking about what happened today. And aggressive she seemed. Eyebrows furrowed, harried, unslept, and on the defensive like a cornered animal who lashed out in false virtue. She cries, what will you cut? Well, if you can't think of anything, I'm sure Canadians can. We'll cut the waste and mismanagement, Sheer retorts and cites a few examples. Your mileage may vary, but he pivots us back to the issue at hand, the carbon tax's impact on the cost of living crisis. But even the Tories won't point out that bleeding people dry until they have no margin is more of the same, a measure against an uprising. Just like when they took our human rights away against the law. Poor rebels are weaker rebels. So fund a poor person today. In fact, you can write ndp.ca slash contact and demand they, run, demand they run me as the NDP candidate against Freeland. I will be running either way. Quote unquote, crocodile tears, Ms. Freeland tells us, are what the Tories cry. Again, presuming that emotion trumps the policies and the law. Well, think again, lady. This is a judge's world. Let me tell you what is common sense, she tells us now, 44 minutes in. Ramping up her signature brand of condescension, warming up for a home run she imagines in her mind. What is it? What will you tell us is common sense? Bodily autonomy? Electoral reform? Making hard drugs unprofitable? Freedom of the press? No, she tells us... Cheap child care is good. It's good to have a child care benefit. It's good to provide dental care this year. Ignoring the subject completely. She merely pivots to using whataboutism as if our universities don't teach logic to the public. The Tories drag us back to the issue, carbon taxes and food prices, but still not to the topic of corporate emitters. One group, the conservatives, want the externalities unpriced so that the rich can rape the earth. And one group wants the externalities priced wrong, so the poor will fund the rate. This is just neoliberalism at its finest, and the controlled opposition of a pseudo-democracy we must replace with a true parliament of true independence. A parliament of true independence. A liberal speaks up, we have an environment plan. Okay, but what about the question? A conservative tells us the liberals are using quote-unquote ignorance as a political strategy. Could be, but it takes one to know one. Freeland resumes the podium, proverbially, and leads with, wait for it, the topic of hypocrisy. Now, this should be good. I mean, this should be rich. After all, she's rich. At 46, 49, she looks upset. You can see the still in the article, folks. You want to bleed the poor, too, she basically retorts. Well, girl, it doesn't work that way. You're every bit as populist as the opposition, which is not at all. You pit one poor bleeding mechanism against another. Why? Because both parties work to prevent revolt by keeping us poor. Too poor to resist, or so they hope, the neoliberal duopoly. From her glass house, Christia throws a stone at Polyev. Quote, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, unquote. The logic is impeccably daft. She reasons, hey, well, you get rich off the backs of Canadians, so I can do it too. That's moral consistency. The block steps in again and gives the rhythm some breathing room. The liberals respond politely, reminding us that mom and dad are fighting, but our French uncle will keep the house together. Melissa Lanceman rears her head, the outspoken conservative Jew of the house. She's smart and hopes some room will open above her. She attacks the Liberals, who respond as if the Conservatives' plan isn't a bargaining position, they're being out of power. Uh, Lanceman replies that the housing initiatives the Liberals pat themselves on the back for are photo ops, while construction is down. Quote unquote, you cannot live in a photo op. Well said, but can she really live with herself in the Conservative Party? What would Moses say? Libs and Tories then con continue to debate if the Liberals have a plan. They're debating whether or not this plan exists, apparently. Not, they proceed not to debate a meaningful alternative. Controlled opposition at its finest. And the subject is changed back to hate crimes. Online hate, the NDP reminds us, needs activity. But don't they see the irony? Hate against the liberals is policed incredibly swiftly. C11, the news ban, you name it. McPherson shows up suddenly from the NDP with a real topic. Um, Cancelling UNRWA is collective punishment and it is illegal, she says. Well then, 
What is the response? The liberals babble that they are quote unquote pausing funding during the investigation. So is it collective punishment or not? Pathetic. What an insult to every Canadian is if they can't follow a simple argument long enough to notice a bald non sequitur. Moving on, the House barely registers the one real thought presented today. Regardless of your opinion of it. Liberals mention another housing photo op. What a psyop. We can see the building on TV. Can't you work like CERB on the housing crisis? You have a coalition for a reason. But actively housing people, like actively employing people and ending the myth of the Nairu, would mean the rich lose leverage. Trudeau's buddies wouldn't see the 2x in their real estate investments they were promised before he was installed. This is all market manipulation. Here's a one, two, three steps for you. Step one, buy more real estate and elect Trudeau. Install Trudeau. Two, Trudeau doubles housing prices. Step three, 100% profit. Profit at whose expense? The 10% of Torontonians accessing the food bank and those who've died, whether from exposure, hunger, or the mental illness of poverty. The Conservatives mention that housing projects should have compensa compensation tied, at least partially, to actually completing a housing process project. Well, guess what? The Liberals call that an insult. Well, I guess they're right, the Conservatives here. The theft is over time, as every photo op promises homes, but never with a deadline, and the developer's hand is out on day one. No response available. They, the Liberals, caught red-handed pivot to emotion. How insulting! How could you insinuate that developers would build faster given a financial incentive? We all know developers build out of the goodness of their hearts for the pure spirit and fun of it. Vote for us. The Conservatives mention rent as having doubled under Trudeau and encampments which have probably grown faster than that. They mention them as well. The reply from the Liberals? Instead of insulting people, I would like to spend time complaining about people insulting people. This takes up several minutes of our collective time in the House, I kid you not. Not a single substantive argument is advanced during this time. A few moments later, another issue has come up. Small businesses are getting gouged and controlled by emergency government loans. Well, here's another way they have us by the balls. We're all at the food banks and the businesses owe the government money, and unless they're mega corporations. Why are they using loans instead of grants? Because this is all you know, emergency funding post-COVID. It's just like Chomsky explained about student debt. It's a disciplinary measure. An advance measure for the pre-crime of independent thought, which is the basis of all democracy more than accuracy is. And uh, Seek endorses jury theorem for more on that. 57 minutes in, Freeland makes her final appearance today. She tries to make a thematic link as if she practiced this. The laughable hypocrisy theme she brings up from before is linked in some kind of literary composition rather than human communication now with the theme of alarmism. Okay, got it. The conservatives are rude, alarmist hypocrites, which makes the liberals what? Polite, underreacting ideologues? Got it. Then she mentions out of nowhere Canada's triple A credit rating, a report card written surely by the globalist she simps for never mind Canadians' individual credit ratings, and it's cited like a thought terminating cliché. Quote, unquote, it doesn't get better than that, she tells us. Well, there you have it, folks. Straight from the mouth of smooth-talking Candide of Canada, this is the best of all possible Canadas, Freeland's Canada, in which money is a fiction, especially if you spend it on love. Or plan to. This Valentine's Day? Have cash withdrawn in advance, because there's no knowing what limits exist to the financial hashtag relational aggression of a woman such as nosy, meddling, evil Christia Freeland. Hide the chocolates, hide the wife. Healthcare, we are told, is where the Tories will cut first, and the retort is they'll cut liberal seats faster. Ha ha ha, but what are the biggest, what about the biggest cut of all the liberals made to healthcare? The cut to life itself by expanding MAID. Did you know that COVID deaths equaled suicide in numbers during Freeland's lockdown, but the numbers have been hidden by expanding MAID? I kid you not, the government's own numbers are all you need, just add them up. Look up the number of deaths by MAID, 
not by the butler, and the number labeled suicide, and add them up. Compare your work to how many died from COVID, or even with COVID. I'll wait, or you can pause this video while you do the math. The conservatives proposed various other cuts, and so could you, and do you know what the response is? This is where the rubber hits the road, and she tells us, quote, we know that they would cut shamefully our support for Ukraine. They would not send weapons to Ukraine, unquote. I mean, I thought it was healthcare, but... But how much military spending is too much, according to Freeland? The sky, or at least the printer, is the limit. Although the actual number, the actual limit is how much they can gouge us before we revolt. The speaker reminds Ms. Freeland not to associate the Tories with the Russians before she speaks, and she retreats to French and pivots back to our bloody credit rating. And when I say bloody, I mean bloody. Printing money doesn't only finance endless war, it also requires it. For fiat currency, what they call it, has no value without a fiat military. But, having been born after the gold standard, Ms. Freeland wouldn't consider the long game for world peace, the end of fiat currency. No, decentralization both of the media and of money is the enemy for Ms. Freeland. Diversity isn't strength in her world if it happens to be diversity of thought. No, a central bank must fund which war to wage, and never mind the real largest source of climate emissions, military spending. Without fiat currency, which the US forced us all onto after Hiroshima, printing money for endless war just wouldn't work unless the government managed to confiscate all the gold in a country as they have in the past to wage authority on people. So fight her back, resist, a central bank digital currency. Resist endless war. So, was she redeemed? Nope, not a fat chance. Those were her last remarks of today's session. See you tomorrow. AdamGolding.ca